only mode. Well, I hope y'all like fishing because we're going on a HIPAA fishing expedition. Uh, my name is Carlos Leva. I'm the CEO of Freelance Publishing, the publisher of the HIPAA Survival Guide, and also attorney and managing partner with Digital Business Law Group. Joining me today is an associate, senior associate with Digital Business Law Group. John Nelson, and as always, uh, our operations manager at Two Lions uh, and DBLG, Martin Gwynn, who will be trolling uh, the chat for questions, which we will take during, um, during the webinar. Martin will, as always, pick the opportune time to interrupt and ask questions. So, uh, and, and then we, we still reserve some time at the end for um, additional Q&A. Uh, I would like to make some comments, though, before we get started here uh, about the recent Yahoo breach, which is interesting just because of the magnitude of the thing. A, a, um, what was it, John? Was it, I mean, is, is it a, a billion records? It's, I mean, it's hard. It's a billion records, I think. They're talking I think about it. It may be up to, it may go up to a billion. I think they're still looking into the precise scope of it, but okay. I thought... I thought yeah. I heard that uh, around 200 million confirmed, but that's just from recollection. Right, but the, the, this is a this is a breach that happened in 2013. So the, the other thing, I mean, I just heard it from the news, and I hadn't really, you know, because uh, it wasn't really a HIPAA breach. But um, yeah, the word they were the number they were throwing around was, was a billion because Yahoo had a breach in 2014 or 2015 that was 500 million. And at that time, that may have been like the largest uh, breach. Um, I think, and I, I'm just talking anecdotally, so don't hold my feet to the fire here. But it's it's a massive breach, and it has um, just about everybody in the cybersecurity space talking about, you know, the kinds of things that that can happen in this space. And as a former, I wrote a post on. Uh, in our LinkedIn group and, and on our Facebook page, um, it's actually on my blog, it's where the posts generally start. Former, former, former NATO Supreme Commander, and I can't recall this gentleman's name, uh, I think he was, he was an admiral. Anyway, he said that cybersecurity is by far uh, probably the biggest national threat um, to our security, and it's it's really pernicious because it's the one that it can have this massive impact, and it's one where we are uh, woefully unprepared. So you know, we—I mean, I think most people know that the United States um, uh, Army, Navy, Armed Forces are is are by far the best in the world. We spend the most money. We have the best technology. I mean, that is just goes unquestioned, so we're, we're, we're definitely prepared for any kind of violence or things that might disrupt world order from that perspective. But from a perspective of, you know, cybersecurity, you have, you have this Yahoo hack, you have this alleged Russian hack or disruption, and it doesn't matter whether or not it's true, somebody hacked in, and, and so it's front and center. Is my point. It is, it's front and center, and this admiral said that that there were two industries, you know, and these are obvious that were the potential targets. And one was the grid, and the other one was financial services. Well, the grid is obvious, right? I mean, because if, if Russia or anybody China, and those would be the likely suspects, took out the grid, then our whole economy stops, comes to a dead stop. Boom, nothing happens, right? No computers work. No, I mean, nothing happens. The economy just stops. And obviously, we would fight to get it back up and running, And but how quickly we could do that, who knows? I mean, that that's really, I mean, a serious attack on our grid is, is, is a declaration of war, I would think. Same thing is true for the financial services industry. An attack on the financial services industry with an intent to disrupt and cause um, systemic um, problems throughout the system to where the system ceases to function and collapses is another obvious threat. I mean, these are obvious places where Russia or China would, would, would attack. But I, I, 
I, I propose that healthcare is probably third on the list, and if it's not third, it's easily within the top five. And one of the reasons that healthcare might be more uh, enticing to Russia or China or some state actor uh, that that um, that's really a proxy for those two uh, is because if you attack healthcare, it probably would be less obvious as to uh, you could probably hide the trail better. And it wouldn't be so obvious that it was a state agent. It would kind of it would be a shot across the bow, you know. And eventually, our, our the CIA and the FBI and the people that investigate that stuff would probably get to the bottom of it. But it wouldn't be, you know, it just a outright declaration of war, right? So I I, I would suspect that 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 would be a place that um, that that China or Russia could start, and we're extremely healthcare is extremely vulnerable. So what, so what would you take away from all that before you start talking about phishing, which is, continues to be a huge uh, problem, is there's a lot of uncertainty in the markets, obviously, because uh, of the Trump effect. And, you know, Trump has said, you know, that he's anti-regulation, but I just don't really see a scenario where, uh, where the U.S. Department of Defense, Congress, et cetera, et cetera, uh, is going to go along with any kind of deregulation that would loosen cybersecurity um, strength or best practices, right? I mean, that would just be politically just not viable for Trump to do, I don't think, right? Cybersecurity being, you know, at the top of everybody's national security concern, you know, I just don't think he's going to walk into HHS and say, you know what? You can stand down on that whole healthcare HIPAA stuff. We're not, we're not going to enforce that. I, I, I really don't think that can. That's plausible politically, uh, even in an environment where Trump may want to eviscerate the EPA. The cybersecurity thing is is something else. Uh, so uh, you know, any, any, anybody that that has hopes that Trump is somehow going to go easier on cybersecurity and really. Yes, yeah, cybersecurity and HIPAA are not one of the same thing, but you know what? At the end of the day, they kind of are. And and healthcare has already been identified as a national security asset, which is again obvious. Obvious that healthcare we have to have healthcare, and healthcare is a is is a vulnerable threat. So um, anyway, I'm, I'm going to get off my soapbox on that. But are, are there any any questions on on that, that kind of like the environment that we find ourselves in and and going forward, what's, what, what may or may not change? Uh, there are no questions at that time, but I can confirm for you, because I looked it up, the 2013 Yahoo hack was over a billion people. Um, one other bit of information, the, the um, slides are in the handout section. OK, and, so um, I would say, to the extent that we're talking about Russia and China as being suspects here, and I, I would just reemphasize what you said before: whether whether the culprit ends up being a um, another national entity or just some private party, just your regular, uh, just your regular bad guy, it's the threat is still out there. Uh, it is. Um, becoming more of a uh, um, state cyber warfare uh, tool, but um, obviously for a long time now, the, uh, the regular bad guy has, has presented most of the threat and will probably continue to present a significant threat in addition to those um, national tools. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. The bad guys, you know, the bad guys are going to continue to get smarter every day. And you just think about the, the number of well-educated bad guys that are in parts of the world where, um, you know, who knows what the future of the EU is. And, and it could break up. And you could have massive sort of, you know, disruption and unemployment. Greece could fail. Italy could fail. I mean, you know, and then you have every, everybody has access almost to a computer. Africa, South America. If you're somebody with the smarts and you have no way of making a living and you can steal U.S. credit cards, from your little whatever village in, in, in Nigeria and and feed your family, you know, what do you, what do you think you're going to do? You have the talent to do that. So uh, this this uh, these threats from just normal bad guys are just going to get worse and worse. That's just life in the 21st century, you know, and I think we, we need to awaken to that. And I don't think we really have awakened. We're at an inflection point, but I think most 
most people really haven't realized the degree to which our world has really uh, changed. So what, what are the learning objectives for today's session? We're going to provide a, try to provide foundational understanding of fishing to help prevent uh, PHI from being compromised. And, you know, like anything else, uh, you, you know, when you talk about fishing, you got to know a little bit about the lingo. Because if you don't speak the lingo, then you're, you know, you're perceived to be an outsider. And, you know, there's some basic things that you got to know about fishing, but it's not as, you know, once you peel back the onion, it's not as complex as it may seem, although it's it's pernicious, it's evil. It's, it's, it's you know, social engineering is one of the biggest ways that the bad guys get access to uh, data. And what you have to do is you have to learn to recognize the patterns. And hopefully most of us have gotten better at recognizing patterns when we see certain email types. I mean, I get them all the time. I get them, you know, there's this, there's this somebody in Asia that wants me to do a contract for them. You know, well, I mean, I get two or three of those, four or five a year probably now. You know, it's just delete. And, you know, recently HHS, their own email versus, uh, with respect to the desk audits that they're doing was hacked, right? And so the bad guys are getting really quite clever in their uh, ability to disguise themselves as, as someone that would be a trusted partner, therefore gets you to click on the link and, you know, uh, uh, perform the, the behavior that allows them to set the trap. Now, you know, I've had, and I'm sure we all have, I've had like letters from my brother-in-law, emails. My brother-in-law never used me emails. You no, know I mean, some, there had to be an emergency, you know, it, it, and so somebody must have gotten a hold of his email address and, you know, hacked it and is now using it because they know that I know him probably through email list. And so they send me, you know, something from this particular individual because I, he's my brother-in-law, I'm more likely to click on that, right? And so you really got to learn internally to practice this as, you know, safe computing. And at the end of the day, it comes down to education, education, education. And, you know, so all of us that do this for a living, you know, um, knowledge workers, but almost everybody today is a knowledge worker, right? Almost everybody today is, whether you're a clinician and you're on the floor most of the day, you still got email coming your way. I mean, it's even worse for clinicians in healthcare because they're so busy, they don't have the time to, you know what I mean, to, to, to go through all this stuff, right? So they're more easily sort of social engineered because, uh, you know, because of their attention span. So this is a problem that's only going to get worse uh, if we don't actually take some prevention. And most of the prevention is education. We're going to be coming out with a training course, a fishing training course as part of our subscription plan to try to address this. So we're going to talk about some technology solutions, and then I'm going to point you to some resources. Uh, most most of the most of the technology solutions are a little bit, um, I wouldn't say far-fetched, but don't put too much faith in that you're going to buy just buy some piece of software and that's going to willy-nilly solve your problem. It's a wicked problem, therefore it's more of a social organizational problem. And so really number three, prevention, education, education, education is where I, I would recommend it, that you make an investment. So, you know, at the end of the day, we want to provide organizational stakeholders with a sense of the kinds of education that might help prevent fishing expeditions. So, you know, we need to start with the definition, and um, here's one. I suppose there are others that would be equally as good, but it's the uh, attempt to obtain sensitive information such as username, passwords, and credit card details and sometimes indirectly money, often for malicious reasons, by masquerading as a trustworthy entity. That's that's the key here, right? Somebody's masquerading as somebody you trust. In an electronic communication, in this case, this this um, definition is, is, is too narrow, really, because uh, if you haven't heard, one of the most common phishing schemes to get entry into, for example, a building where uh, you where usually you need to have security access is to show up with a bunch of pizza boxes or be the donut guy in the morning because everybody lets the pizza guy in and everybody lets the donut guy in, right? It's just like, you know, you open the door for them, right? It's food. You know, we all love going to meetings better. We hate meetings, but we 
we prefer when there's, you know, donuts or stuff like that, right? So we, or pizza, we, so we let them in, right? And once they're in, they find and, and you know, they're, they can e more easily get into the network, right? They're in your building, they can find an unsecured jack, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, you know, bottom line is it doesn't always happen through electronic communication. Obviously, there's some word games here as to how the word phishing, uh, you know, came to be in use, uh, bait, in an attempt to catch a victim. Uh, but essentially, it's using human psychology, knowledge about how we behave to get us to give up stuff that we normally wouldn't give up. Okay, so it's not it's not your hacker, it's not your, um, it's not that kind of high-tech approach. It's, it's sophisticated in the sense that, obviously, uh, social psychology, human psychology, and social psychology is immensely complex and, um, and, and interesting, right, as, as a subject of study. And the bad guys that, 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 that thrive on social engineering study human conduct so that they can get what they want. Obviously, you know, you're looking Sorry. at... Go ahead, John. Sorry, I just make one point here. Uh, it's, it's true that it's not very technically... Uh, it's gen generally the methods aren't very uh, technically complex, but they are presentationally complex because one of, one of the biggest um, methods of getting someone to let down their guard is obviously to look trustworthy, but you the more, uh, the, the better you can present that officialness of, hey, this is Bank of America, it's your monthly account is ready for review, just click here to download your latest statement. And that, that email is, is much more frequently now starting to look very, very much like an actual email that Bank of America or whoever would send you. And then you click on that link and you're brought to a, a website that looks like it's from Bank of America. Uh, so, it's it's really more of a presentational complexity. No, it is trying it, it, to. It, it, no, right. It's insidious, though, in the in the sophistication that the presentation can use, right, to, to to be able to mimic something that you find trustworthy, right? And, right. and they're taking advantage of the fact that time is the scarcest resource for everybody. So when you so you're not going to spend a lot of time saying you know taking apart this email to see if it really really is Bank of America. Uh, yeah, not not unless you've been taken before and you, you're now you're now cautious as to just about every email that you get. Now there are certain things, certain email etiquette that before you click can really serve you well. And one of them is, and we'll get. To, I think we get to that when we get to the prevention. But one of them is hover over any link before you click on it, and make sure that that is a what appears to be a Bank of America uh, legitimate URL, and not a URL that is misspelled by a single letter, or you know, instead of Bank of America .net, it's Bank of America US or Bank of America .fr. Or, you know, so so you can use the browser as a way to sort of, you know, put a toe in the water and kind of, you know, peel back the onion a little bit and see, you know, what is this thing? And, you know, and, you know when in doubt, call IT or just delete it. And if you, if Bank of America really needed to get in touch with you that bad, they'll try again and they'll, they'll call you. Now, phishing is just, phishing education is just one more thing that, should help you build a good compliance story, a good compliance narrative, right? Are you are you training your people? One thing is to train your people on the privacy rule, security rule, breach notification rule. You should do that, and and it shouldn't be the feel good training that everybody used to do. Everybody needs to be more HIPAA literate uh, these days and have a basic understanding of the rules. I mean, everybody, your clinicians, your management, you know, don't just have that feel good stuff you had prior to the High Tech Act. It's just not sufficient, okay? Um, and, and and in addition to that, you have sort of these subtopics now, like mobile, okay, and the cloud, and social media, and, you know, all these things where you can actually be fooled or trapped, right? Like you can't, right? You can't take a pic of a patient and upload it, even if the patient you know, was saying, okay, you know,
know, it's like you took the picture, you uploaded it, you know, if there's any indication of uh, who the patient is, and obviously unless their face is covered, the whole, whole world or their whole world probably knows who the patient is and, you know, friends and family or whatever, you know, they know what hospital and so on, right? So it's like, yeah, we love to take pics, you know, but you, so they're, you, the HIPAA education, the good story narrative in, in this particular area is training. A training applies to the, you know, your story in a big way across the board, but phishing is just one, one more thing that you need to train uh, staff on. So Martin, any, any questions so far? Not yet. Okay. So the, the vocabulary, right? Social engineering, and I don't need to read these to you because you guys can read them, but it's really psychological manipulation. And um, I can tell you a little story just how insidious this is and just how, uh, you, just how the, the definition of an electronic communication is way, way, way too narrow because phishing is just so much more sophisticated than that. Uh, recently moved, and I had a neighbor of mine tell me about this scam where somebody said that um, they were supposed to, there was a warrant for their arrest, and they were supposed to show up a month ago for some sort of trial or something, and if they didn't pay, you know, $7,500 in a fine, they would be arrested. And I got to tell you, this, this was not a naive, what you would think was a naive uh, individual. And they wound up paying $7,500. And I said, look, this is well, guaranteed a scam. You don't get sued, and you don't know about it, right? When you get sued, somebody serves you papers. Now, it may sound stupid, but we don't, you know, a lot of us, if you, if you, if you don't pay attention to the legal industry, you don't know how things work. It's what did they what did they use? They used the fear of authority, a fear of going against authority, a fear of you know the man showing up at your door, putting cuffs on you in front of your friends and family, and taking you away because you you did something wrong, right? And if, you know fear of what authority you know could do to you. Now it's a little odd. Think about that. Think about how clever that is. It's a little odd because you don't think. This is why it works. You don't think in a country like America, some scam like that would work. Now, eventually, you know, they said, you know, yes, this is the uh, sheriff's department from so and so county. You know, blah 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 blah. But you, just, you know, that you think, well, that may work in a banana republic, but that that doesn't work here. And it does. It does because Americans, like you know, citizens almost everywhere, have this respect. Uh, or in some cases fear, uh, but I, I, I think not yet here. But you know, the, I think it would be respect for authority, and so the bad guys use that. You know, and and unfortunately, my neighbor paid some money that he'll never get back. So um, backdoor. I mean, that's just a way in. You know, uh, that they're, they're using through social engineering to get your account. Username and password, whatever it is, whatever it is that they're trying to get. Cloning is what um, John just talked about, making something look just like a Bank of America um, email. You know, link manipulation is the same sort of thing. You know, making the link, link look exactly like something like from Bank of America, except you got one or two characters off, or something is off about that. And that's where you can use the browser technique and sort of say. Well, wait a minute. Is this how legitimate? You know, blah blah blah. Why would why would they be doing? You know, and uh, again, if you have any doubt at all, just delete it because it, it will. Somebody will contact you again if they if they need to, right? So, um, most of these, right? You can you can kind of just get on your own. But spear phishing is a focused type of phishing, usually targeting a single individual or a small group, right? So they really narrowed it down to like, for example, this. I got a contract in, uh, you know, I'm an Asian company and I'm buying blah, 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 and I want you to do this contract and just send me blah, 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 where, you, where we can wire the money. We selected you. And they're targeting lawyers. And you would think that lawyers know better, but what is the social engineering going on right now? Well, there's thousands of country lawyers out there. There's thousands of lawyers that, you know, aren't, aren't 
making as much money um, as they like, or you know, lawyers are just generally greedy, you know, and and full of themselves to think, yeah, out of the millions of lawyers out there, somebody in Asia just picked me. <laughs> I won the lotto, right? And you know, because why? Because I'm really, really good, and they, you know, my reputation must be known all the way, and you know, wherever, you know, and and so they target lawyers, right? They're like spearfish, and lawyers are like. And lawyers get caught up in this stuff all the time. Zero day, if you haven't heard that right, zero day is, um, John, you can talk a little bit about this. Zero day is just a new hack, you know, that a new vulnerability that's come out that nobody knows really, nobody knew anything about, and, and, and now everybody's busy trying to figure out how to plug this hole, right? Yeah, yeah, it's a problem that... Uh... There's no, there's no current fix for. And that's really the oh crap moment is a is a zero day uh, threat. Right, and how quickly it can, it can spread, and you know, you know, blah blah blah. Right, so uh, yeah, you know, these are these sort of things to pay pay attention to. Uh, and obviously, you know, you're a compliance officer, you're responsible for all HIPAA. You got to have somebody sort of north winding you in your IT department or something that something may be happening that may be putting PHI in jeopardy, right? And that's why you know the the security rule mandates that you track security incidents and you know blah blah blah. If I'm an auditor, that's one of the first questions I want to ask you is well, tell me about tell me about how you track security incidents, right? And you got to understand that an incident is not really just a breach but an attempt is also an incident and you know yada 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 this voice phishing is just another form of social engineering that's what they use to get my neighbor so who's going to be responsible for preventing this from happening in your organization obviously you as in everybody right because if 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 we are as individuals are not trained to you know it's like right like safe sex then this is safe computing you know, you really got to be careful, extra careful. And if you've ever been burned, you know what it can do to you. It can ruin your day. You got to reinstall your OS. Martin, you got some more stories about this happening to you. And you know, it's just it's no, not not specifically fishing, but you know, we've all been we've all been targets in the past. And, and you know, and and so obviously, you as the compliance officer, if that's your job, service part of your responsibility to train your staff on, on phishing because phishing is one of the big ways in. It's one of the big ways in. It's going to continue to be one of the big ways in and, it, and it's got nothing to per se to do with complex technology. As John was saying, what it has to do with is complex presentation, right? The, the, the way they um, get you off your guard is by being super sophisticated and how they present this thing that that you are supposed to trust, right? And yeah, I mean, we say it's not technology based, but there is a lot. Of, there is a lot of technology that go to that goes into that presentation, right? If you're gonna if you're gonna make a site look exactly like Bank of America, then you got some really knowledgeable uh, bad guys that you know understand. PHP, CSS, HTML5, whatever, you know what I mean? Because they got to be good enough to uh, to do that. And so at some point, uh, your executive team has, uh, you know, is going to have responsibility because that's where the buck is going to stop, right? So at least they, the executive team and everybody else in the organization needs to be literate about what it is. You can't have an auditor come in and ask managing director, you know, tell me what you know about social engineering, or what's you know, and, and have that person have that deer in the headlights look is like fishing, really? I mean, that's like like going out to the golf or what? You know, it, they you got to be at least educated, right? Or they're going to get one foot. A, they're at risk, and B, you're probably going to get whacked. Um, we, go ahead. we do have a question. What do you mean by an attempt is a security incident? I ask because our public website servers are constantly under attack from ones trying to log into them. Also, our firewall is constantly probed and checked for weaknesses. Right. Now, those, those attacks are 
if you go look at the definition of security incident, it will it will say, and I could probably go find it uh, for you right now, but I, I might be wandering off into the HIPAA survival guide and, I, and get distracted. But uh, the definition of security incident is um, an attempt or a successful, what you might say, is breach. And people, so people misunderstand. Some some people will think that security incident means breach, and it doesn't because if you've uh, like in the case of the questioner, if you've had all these attempts but they've been rejected by your firewall, then okay, that's not a that's not a breach. Nothing happened. There was an attempt though. It is a security incident, and so the um, um, the security rule requires you to log security incidents, which are bigger than breaches. And that's now you you know, you, you, it can, you can go from the ridiculous to the absurd, almost to the sublime. Um, and by the way, if you want to avoid that people survivor guide little video, just back click one time. It only comes up the first time you go out there. Um, let me see if I can find a definition for you. But yeah, this is a confusing area because it um, because a lot of people don't realize that security incident means uh, attempt as well. Okay, I think it may be part of the definitions that are associated with the security rule itself. And hopefully all you guys know that this HIPAA survival guide has the full text of the uh, HIPAA regulations and statute and your security incident. Okay, and what it means means the attempted or successful unauthorized access, use, disclosure, modification, or destruction of information or interference with systems operation in an information system. So there you go. An attempt is a security incident. Okay, and and the security rule says you have to track uh, security incidents, right? And so how do you do that? Right, and well, one way, like the questioner said, well, we have these logs, and we can look at the logs, and we can see that it was attempted, but it was rejected, repelled. Well, that's one way of, of, of tracking, right? There's, and I mean, do you log every one of those thousand attempts? No, because that's probably absurd, impossible, and the law really doesn't require you to do the impossible. But the, should somebody be looking at those logs? Yes. And should those logs, in general, be you know tracked? Yes, because how do you know that those logs may say, yeah, you know, you know, 999 got repelled, but this one got in, right? And now the consensus in the cybersecurity space, the consensus among the experts is forget your firewall and your proxy servers and all that stuff. Forget the perimeter because the perimeter can't be protected. You have to assume the bad guys can get in, and then what are you going to do? That, you know, because... Like one of the big measurements now is what they call dwell time, which means reducing dwell time, which means reducing the amount of time that the bad guys have already been in your network looking for that honeypot of stuff they can use. And that stuff they can use just may be a safe harbor to launch an attack somewhere else, but now they're using your servers because your servers are not suspicious. Okay, so you still, it's not to say that you don't have a firewall, proxy servers and all that kind of, you still have to do that. But you can't assume that your perimeter is going to be can't be penetrated. In fact, you have to assume uh, the exact opposite. And let me just go just for grins to show you. Um, so then, uh, if you're tracking all of your uh, more traditional incidents of probing firewalls and stuff like that, would you also track when you receive a phishing email? Yeah, that's an incident. That's out, that's clearly an incident, you know what I mean. And the the the, the question from a practical perspective, and John, um, I'll get back to your your comment in a second. But it's this administrative safeguard standard six is security incident procedures. That's the standard, and then there's the implementation specification uh, beyond that, which is identify and respond to suspected or known security incidents mitigate to the extent practicable harmful effects during that are known to the covered entity or blah, 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 in their outcomes, you know. So if you're not tracking, if you're not looking for them, how can you identify and respond? 
right? So you have to have a method to track. Uh, and like I said, you have to log every one of those thousand. No, but the logs from the logs, you can see that there are a thousand attempts, but mostly they're they're not they're not getting in. So I don't know if there's any follow up question to that. Uh, just just an, a, a number. I had 24,000 failed logins on my web server, and the question was, do I have to log all 24k of those as security incidents? No, I mean I think that would be that would be absurd. You know, uh, and John, I'm not sure. I went back to your comment, but the law does not require you know, an absurdity, right? So this is this is where you know you just have to apply some common sense. There's no way you can individually log. And why would you do that, right? Law 24,000 unsuccessful attempts to your web server. I mean, that would be madness. It would keep you from doing the kinds of things that you that would really have payout from a a, a, a security perspective. The law, the law. I mean, you know, the, the, to be honest with you, the, the security rule is a monster. Everybody that looks at it initially says it's a monster, but it's really the more you look at it, it's it's IT 101. Okay, it's security IT 101. It's foundational, right? There are much more sophisticated things that you should be doing, controls that you should be applying that don't even exist in the security rule. So you only have limited resources and limited budget. HHS recognizes that, and your challenge is to do the best you can for an organization of your size, complexity, resources, et cetera, et cetera, which is codified in the security rules flexibility principle. It's one. 64.306, okay, and so it says you can take into consideration all these factors, so obviously it would just be absurd to spend all your time logging 24,000 uh, unsuccessful attempts to your web server. You, your resources could be better applied somewhere else. And it sounds like the current logs would, would capture the requirement to track those things, because you're would, able yeah. to go out now instantly and see, whoa, 24,000. Right. That would be that would be my take if I was a judge or a lawyer or an auditor, right? And that's that would be what I would argue if I were your lawyer. Is that hey, we have these logs, you know, but John brought up an interesting point. What about a phishing? Yeah, that's an attempt. Okay? That's definitely an attempt. And that's an incident that you really do want to log and sort of isolate. And the reason you want to log and treat a phishing incident more than you would an unsuccessful attempt at your web server is the way that you really prevent phishing is through education. The way that the, the, the way that you deliver the education is by trying to show um, your workforce the kinds of phishing patterns that have been successfully used elsewhere. Okay, and we'll talk about um, some technology solutions, but they have companies now that will go out and mimic and actually do phishing attacks on your organization, just like, you know, companies will do penetration tests, unbeknownst to anybody, right? The CEO or some compliance officer hires them and to say, hey, see if you can successfully uh, implement a phishing scheme in my organization. And they will, they have these simulators, well, they will, they'll do that, right? And that's one form of really, really sophisticated training. Now, you, you know, I got to believe that most people that that kind of sort of simulation and all that is going to be only for the really, really big covered entities that have the, the resources to do that or have the kind of risk where they think that, that that's required. Uh, but, yeah, I would not, not all security incidents should be treated equally, okay? And obviously in our breach notification framework, as an example, you know, we have a list of things that you go through and you say, well, wait a minute, let me see. Does this have anything to do with PHI? You know, if they're attacking the server, right? So you have you have like you have like first order questions. Does that particular web server does that have any PHI on it? No. Well, then, you know, the, your analysis is done. You can log the incidents. You can log that your logs show the twenty-four thousand attempt. But hey, it wasn't attempt on a, a, an information system that had PHI. Now, if it was your EHR server. Right? Then obviously it does have PHI, and that would be attempt, an attempt that you would have to log, uh, be aware of for uh, the security rule because it has PHI on it. So that, you know, and, 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 and that's sort of where the analysis starts. You start eliminating things 
and the first big thing you can eliminate is say, hey, is this an information system that contains PHI? No? Okay. Well, we're not worried about that incident. I mean, you might be worried about it. I don't want to be cavalier. You might be worried about it for some other reason, but you're not worried about it from a security rule uh, perspective. So it's unsurprising, I think, that there's a phishing life cycle, and uh, the, uh, most of the time is spent by the bad guys on the plan. Right? How are they going to get you? The more sophisticated the plan, the more likely, the higher the success. Then they're going to initiate an attack, and they're going to initiate an attack of millions and millions of potential victims because they only need a small percentage to be successful. They only need a small percentage to be super successful you know, a 0.1% out of a 2 million attempt where they actually get credit card information is really, really profitable uh, to them, right? So they're going to launch an attack, and it's usually going to be, uh, you know, big numbers. They're going to then gather the information and go look for the places that look the most favorable, maybe for follow-up, phishing, whatever, right? So they're, they're, they're in the intelligence gathering you, this is not like some, you know, uh, some not knowledgeable. These are super sophisticated uh, criminals. Okay, these are guys are really smart, and this is just how they make their living. You know what I mean? And so, you you got to do all you can to just keep up with them, right? So you can't you can't under underestimate the enemy, all right? So that's that's the life cycle is that you know that they go through that. You know, I don't know how much it helps you directly, but the, the, the number of examples is eliminated only by the, 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 the bad guy's imaginations, right? We used to have the whole Nigerian prince thing that whatever it needed to get was, if you help them out, you're going to get 500000 and that, I don't know, Martin, how long did that thing go on? Oh, it's still going on. They've updated now. They have a, a, a photo of the Nigerian prince, you know, surrounded by his uh, subjects so it's so this fishing scheme has been going on for like 30 years probably right yeah. <laughs> I mean it's Something been going like on that. probably before John was born the Nigerian mm. Prince fishing scheme was already out there in the wild right this Asian contract thing it's probably limited to lawyers because it's attacking it's spear fishing you know what I mean it's trying to get you know lawyers that are hungry and need more money blah 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 uh, this account validation is what we talked about, you know, where you have the Bank of America uh, looking exactly like your Bank of America account, and, you know, and that's why you click, because they've done such a, a sophisticated presentation that they fool you, um, right? This is, you know, social engineering that has nothing to do with an electronic communication, the pizza or donut guy, you just open the door, right, for them. And, you're unsuspecting. That's the whole thing. Nobody suspects the pizza guy to be a hacker, right, or the donut guy. Um, an example is the, the HHS death audit email that went out. That was a complete total efficiency scheme, right? Now, think about how narrow and how sophisticated that has to be. There are bad guys that understand that HHS is doing death audits. They understand that HHS goes about doing these death audits in a particular way and asks for particular documents and probably has links in there to explain the kind of stuff that they're looking for. And so somebody, some smart uh, fishing guy decides, oh, this is great, man. Look at this. Look, this is sweet. We got, a, we got a government agency out there looking for information. You know, how, how many people uh, do you think have fallen for this? Who knows? But I, I, I suspect more than one. I suspect that you, you might have, and I don't know how many of these went out, but let's just do some back of the envelope calculations that HHS recently came out with. I think, I think this is a number that, I'm, I'm pulling this really from, from memory, but, but there, are, there are approximately 700,000 providers in the U.S., healthcare providers, right? Um, and obviously, they're covered entities. And um, the covered entities, each uh, healthcare provider has, on average, now this is a number that comes from HHS, 
on, has on average 167 business associates, right? So you do the math as to the total market size of the attack here. And yes, okay, not your normal ambulatory clinic, you know, primary care provider doesn't have 167 business associates, but Kaiser Permanente has 20,000, right? So on average, I mean, it's a huge space for, uh, for a phishing attack. So that's just an example, really, of how sophisticated these attacks can be and just how uh, the ingenuity of the attackers, okay? And like I said, this is, they're getting smarter all the time, right? They're getting smarter all the time. It's just more and more people are, are making money through fraud, um, you know? So I, I don't see anything uh, in the near term that is going to make this trend stop. That means that covered entities and business associates just have to get smarter about what they do, the kind of training they have, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, here's another example, right? These are all, these are all personal examples that I'm aware of, right? Um, I, you know, I think there might have been a BOA thing, uh, but I, I just deleted that because I knew BOA wouldn't be contacting me, you know, so. Uh, but it's the human factor, right? That's social engineering. That's social engineering is getting inside our heads and getting us to trust some authority figure, something that says, no, this, this is okay, this is, you know, this is a good guy, right? And um, I don't know if, if any of you have ever read Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink, which is an awesome book about how we make decisions at the blink of an eye, how we're kind of programmed to run this algorithm really, really fast to determine is this something good, bad, is this something that's going to do me harm, we're kind of wired because we have to make decisions uh, uh, at a blink, other, otherwise we wouldn't survive, right? And so that gets back to John's point is that they're taking advantage of uh, the attention factor. Uh, how much time, right? And everybody Everybody is living in a in a world where time appears to be coming more compressed, right? It's, we all are feeling this time pressure now. More, we got more things going on. We got more notifications that we get. I mean, we get and some notifications are good, but some notifications just drive you crazy. Like, you know, the notifications from Walgreens when there's your scripts are ready. It's like you forgot which ones you automate automatically did. And, should you go now and pick them up, or are they, you know, and they'll, they just seem to send you, like, endless notifications, and I'm like, well, you know, to the point where, like, boy, this isn't really helpful for me. I'm overloaded with notification, and so then what do I do? I, I just throw up my hand. I stop paying attention to them. I'm like, you know, I'm like, forget it. I'll call them, or if I run out of meds, then I'll go scream and holler and whatever, you know what I mean? But it's, 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 we live in that kind of world. We all kind of, and we, we just have to be aware of it, right? It's that, look, there, there are people that understand that we live in that world and are going to take advantage of us because they know that we're strapped for time. They know that we got all these things that are, that are hitting us at, at one time, right? And it's just, it's just the nature of the beast. It's this, it's this inflection point that we're at where, where our world is really changing. Porn is huge, right? Now, I, I mean, this is so insidious, John. I don't, do, you know, do you know what the term uh, Rick rolled is? Uh, yes. I'm never going to give you up uh, nor let you down. <laughs> what the, <laughs> what the, the hell is that? Is that the, is that the song? Uh, yes, uh, Rick Rowling is, uh, you're provided with a link that appears to be innocuous. Uh, you click on it and you are brought to a video of never going to give you up there. I forget if that's actually the, the Well, he, yeah, here's the thing that so, but you go to, you go to sites like Bloomberg, you go to sites like Huffington Post, and at the bottom of it, you, you have these things like, oh, you would not believe what this star looks like now, right? Or you would. Yeah, uh, click it. And you click it. And it's got nothing to do with the headline at all. It's got some other, red, you know, like the first five times I did that, I'm like, what? Why did, why did yeah, I? I mean, it's a similar tactic, uh, as is often used in phishing, because uh, 
like two of the types of examples that we talked about. One, one attempt is trying to look innocuous, trying to look harmless. This is, you can trust me, don't even think about it. The other kind in, goes on the completely opposite end of the spectrum and uses your own alarm. Hey, there's a warrant out for your arrest and you better act right now. So either way, you're intended not to think about it too much, but just using very different emotions uh, that they try to trigger to get you there. Right, and, and, and what, what was so insidious and, and evil from my perspective is this is like, you know, the Huffington Post is not a, you know, a, a site that you would be alarmed about, right? I mean, I go out there sometimes, I go to CNN, I go to Bloomberg. If I just want to check headlines, right, because Huffington Post aggregates headlines, and Bloomberg does too, and, you know, the BBC, and so, right? And, and, and all of them are doing this now because it pays, right, because they're, they're using their, they get paid per click for ads, it's advertising dollars to them. And they got, so they're using, they are using their own legitimacy to rickroll you and to click in on all this other garbage they have at the bottom that has nothing whatsoever to do with what the headline is or what the link is, you know? And it's like, all right, I felt like I'm pretty sophisticated, you know, cyber lawyer, internet lawyer, whatever, man. I was like on the net in 1995, right? I'm dating myself, right? It's like. You know, and you know, wow, this is like, like this is new. It's like, why do they do that, right? It's like, it's like you know, you see headlines, for example, like uh, what would it be? Oh, uh, like Tom Brady never to play again, or something like that, right? If you're a football fan, right? It's like, really, what like happened? Something shocking. So you yeah, on it and, yeah. right. It's, it's always something shocking. Like, yeah, you know, and it's like you click on that, it's got nothing to do with Tom Brady. You know what I mean? It's like, what? And why why do they get you? Well, because you didn't suspect that Bloomberg or or um, you know or the Huffington Post or one of those sites would be doing that, right? And they're they're doing it for profit. So you know it's not you know it's it's almost puts into doubt who the bad guys are. All right. So the question really is, well, you know, the germane question is, what the hell do we do about this, right? What how do we counteract this and these are just, you know, I mean, these, this is really a prescription for safe computing. There's no magic wand. Like, really, get in the habit of never sending passwords or financial information in, in the Internet over clear text. That's just something that you get in the habit of. If you have to, for example, if we have to pass a password for whatever reason, you know, because we're sharing resources or whatever, you know, we might do it over chat. We might do it over Skype chat. But... You know, but we use those mechanisms because we think they're less likely to be hacked than sending something clear text over the Internet, okay, which is more dangerous. Not that chat is super, and we got to communicate somehow, is, you know, super safe, guaranteed to be safe, but, you know, it's we believe that it's safer than clear text. You, you well, I'm still working on you uh, for diving into the one password uh, pass management. Just a little shout out to them there. Uh, so if, uh, yeah, well, if you, you want can, to, yeah, you can uh, talk a little bit about that. I mean, that's obviously one a, a solution. Uh, just because you know, I, I don't know about you guys, but um, literally, I I must use thirty or forty different services now that I have to have a password for. Like, yeah, know, it's easy to. Everything. Uh, yeah, it's it's easy to lose track of exactly how many accounts you have, both for your business and personal life, uh, that that you need to keep track of. And supposedly, they're all supposed to be long, complex, unique passwords. And I mean, I I actually just discovered by by starting to use a password manager, I've got over seventy accounts. And there's no way uh, that I'm going to keep in my head 70 long, complex, unique passwords. And, you know, no one else is going to do that either. So you end up using the same passwords over and over, which, which presents inherent security issues. And if, uh, if you'd like to regain some more control over your, your own use of passwords for your uh, for your um, covered entity or BA, or just just personally, because a lot of a lot of personal interaction also a lot of personal use also happens on company computers to one extent or another. You know, people checking Facebook, email, things like that. And so what uh, a password manager can really. 
Right. So the name of that product that you use, and it's uh, is one password, right? Uh, that's what I use. That's like what I generally recommend to friends and family. Other right. popular ones are uh, OnePass or Dashlane. Um, all very well reviewed, but <clears throat> they also provide the ability to share passwords instantly with people, so you can maintain that encryption without having to just send something in plain text or in a chat box or something like that. Right. And so there's there's you know, uh, and unlike my strategy, which is you know have um, seventy different file folders that that really aren't the equivalently uh, the equivalent of a sticky note because I, I will encrypt not really encrypt like with an encryption algorithm but I won't have the password there I'll just have maybe the first letter and the last token but I know what that is and, and it's some variation of the three or four passwords that I use right and so what John is um, you know uh, saying is hey this okay that's you know better than nothing, you know, but it's probably not as good as, the, you know, this one password solution, right? And obviously, we should all know that, that the security rule requires password management, and now I don't think you could get uh, away from reasonable and appropriate being anything but the equivalent of what's called a strong password, right? It has so many characters in length, has upper and lower case characters, has some special characters that you got to use, whatever, right? There's an algorithm uh, or various definitions of what a strong password uh, should have, and that's what you, that's the policy that you should be implementing, right? You don't really need to figure out and invent the wheel. I mean, you can go out there and, 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 and find it easily, just search for a strong password, but, okay, I mean, so, the, that's an example, right? Use caution and clicking on links. We already talked about that. Hovering over, uh, using the browser and trying to look at that address. Uh, and if we can, on this point, let's if we can talk just a little bit about subdomains and how those are used to uh, trick you into thinking that you're looking at bankofamerica.com. So a subdomain is is with is held within a particular website. So let's say that I have john.com. And I create a subdomain called that I label. I get to name it whatever I want. Bank of America. So when this, when that address is presented to you, Bank of America, the subdomain, that actually comes first in the address. So when you hover over it, it would say Bank of America John com. And if you read over it very quickly, you just see the first thing you see is Bank of America, and then you just look past it. So keep in mind. Um, uh, those little dots in between the names to make sure you're really going to the place where you think you're going. You're going to Bank of America, you're not going to John.com. Right, and see that's a great example, right, because because, it, because you will see, and anybody can create a Bank of America.John.com. Uh, subdomains are, I mean, you just have control over the domain you can create. You know, if you're not careful, if you're not, if you don't, you know, you're not, haven't been trained on uh, safe computing techniques. You know, you would you would know that. First of all, if you saw that subdomain, the Bank of America would never send you something from a subdomain. Period. You know, right now that it's it's not legit, right? Because you hovered over it and you say, "Oh, look at this! This is subdomain. How clever!" That that's where they're trying to get me. You know, what I mean, so yeah, that you know that that's. I mean, the, the, it's getting you with respect to uh, electronic phishing. It's getting you to click on the link and how sophisticated they are to do that. One, one ploy is that, you know, you've been especially selected for blah, blah, blah. This is the Asian contract thing. We've done our due diligence and your firm does blah, blah, blah. Give us an estimate and send us the account. We can wire the money, you know. I, I, I'd say one of the biggest things is really slow down a little bit, right? You know that some sources are trusted and you know some things are weird, really. I mean, I, I just think, you say, I'm saying you, like the world, you, I think the more we sort of live in this space, right, the more we become these sort of social computing animals, the more instinctive we get about, you know, what something, you know, if something looks correct or not, if something looks suspect or not, and you got to slow down enough to say, well, wait a minute, man, this doesn't, this doesn't look quite kosher to me. And like I said, my, my first response is, 
I just delete it, right? And I delete, I delete and report as spam, all kinds of stuff. And lawyers are, are the worst. You know, I should probably sue them for the Can Spam Act, but just sending you stuff that they got on some list that they're violating the law, and I'm like, you know what, I don't even have time for, C, you know, the CLE reminders, right? They're always, you know, sending stuff about that. Um, I just delete them and report them as spam. I don't even look at them anymore. So you get, you know, you get to have instincts about it. Um, never send money anywhere, you know, unless you're sure about the destination. And, you know, I, I just had a client um, turn me on to, to use a, a 60s phrase. Man, I don't know if anybody uses that phrase anymore with baby boomers or because it had a certain connotation. <laughs> Uh, but a client turned me on to um, this thing called Quick Pay, that is free payment from sponsored by Chase and all the big banks, Bank of America is where I bank, it, participate in this thing, and it's like it allows your customers to pay you through an email address, and you don't get whacked at 2.9 percent that PayPal whacks you when you get paid through PayPal. Okay, and all I had to do was at first I'm like. Okay, is this a scam? So what do I do? Is quick pay a scam? Tell me more about I go research, right, because this is a client saying, hey, I can pay you this way. How do I know that this new client is really not just trying to scam me or pretending to be a client and is trying to scam me, right? And, okay, I discovered that it was legit. Not only was is it legit, it's a great way to get paid because I don't have to, um, I don't have to, uh, um, you know, pay uh, PayPal the 2.9%. If my customer's on quick pay and I'm on quick pay, the customer just sends me money. It's all good, right? So so technology can be a wonderful thing, but my initial reaction, what's the scam here? What's the play? I hadn't heard of quick pay. So, right, this is, uh, it was new to me. So I checked it out, right? Now, I didn't spend hours because I, like, you know, within about 10 minutes, I, okay, this is Chase. Oh, what are they doing? Oh, they're trying to get more account holders. They're trying to get, you know, cut PayPal out of this market, you know, blah, blah, blah. So uh, pattern recognition is really what we're talking about. We're talking about pattern recognition of what the bad guys do. That's the biggest training uh, that you can provide is examples of phishing schemes that have been used uh, successfully in the past, okay? Safe computing are the things that we've just been talking about. They're, they're basic. They appear to be common sense. They're things that all us veterans now sort of do just by habit, but it really took a while to get the habit, you know, of not sending passwords and clear text. And, you know, and John is taking it a step further and saying, well, you know, I, I, I'm going to be even more sophisticated on about how I manage my 70 accounts. And, you know, I don't think I have 70, but I think I have about 30. And, yeah, it's daunting, really, just trying to figure out. And sometimes, you know, whatever, you got to let some people in, and then when they're done doing their thing, you, you want to shut it down. So it's crazy um, hard, really. Uh, wicked. It's a wicked problem. So we talked about this. This phishing simulation, right? If you have the resources and all that, you, there's companies out there that will go simulate phishing schemes and see if they can be successful in your organization. So that's one thing. Uh, there's this thing called the sender policy framework that allows, I think, DNS servers to, if you register, to validate that the sender is really who the sender says they are. Now, obviously, you know, we're, we're at a wonkish IT security thing, you know, um, issue here, right? You got to get your IT uh, department into this thing, but, you know, it, it may be worth looking at, right, is to you know, participate in this sort of thing. And I think that, that that's the kind of prevention mechanis mechanisms that are going to evolve is you start shutting down these doors so that you have this sort of framework that it, once you do your thing and register, it can validate that, that, um, that this is actually something coming from the, uh, Bank of America. You know, and and we'll reject it because it doesn't meet this because it doesn't meet the signature of the sender. All right, so these are kinds of things to um, look at. It. it prevents sender address forgery, which is uh, not all of phishing, but it can be a lot of phishing. 
And finally, here's some resources that I validated are still good. There's a ton of resources out there. It really is about education, education, education. And again, I want to pause and just see if there's any questions. Yes, we have a few and a couple comments. First of all, I'm going to make a comment. If it seems too good to be true, it is. Right, as a general rule. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have a patient. Uh, our, our patient system is hosted online. Do we need to log security incidents from the vendor, or are they responsible for it? Well, you're both responsible for it because um, if your patient system is online, then that vendor is a, a business associate of yours. you got to have a business associate contract uh, with that vendor, and you got to make sure that you've um, gotten satisfactory assurances that business associate is complying with the three rules, because now after the High Tech Act, they're on the hook statutorily for complying with the breach notification rule, the privacy rule, and the security rule. So what does it mean to get satisfactory assurances if you believe that all it means is signing that that um, you know that business associate contract and you're setting yourself up for a negligence suit uh, when when your vendor gets hacked? Okay, now the vendor is the one that has to comply, has to track those incidents. It's their system. As a business associate, you know you don't need to track that stuff, but you need to have your contracts in place, and you need to somehow have gotten satisfactory assurances that they're doing the right thing. Okay, the comment here is major phishing attacks always increase this time of year, and there was apparently a story in USA Today about a fake package delivery notice, which, you know, I assume it said like they couldn't deliver it, you opened it up, and it was malware and ransomware. Uh, that was a comment. And what are your thoughts on using password so storage tools? Well, you know, John just made the case, I think, a little while ago uh, for for the use of them. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and, you know, yes, there is some complexity involved in getting them set up organizationally, right? And that's why HIPAA is such a wicked problem because it's not so much a wicked technology problem, although it's it's definitely not trivial. The, the things you have to do and know to comply with the security rule, but you get this organizational problem. You have you have people have certain habits about what they do with passwords and how they compute, how they manage this thing that they interact with on a daily basis. And I got to tell you, if it hasn't happened to you, it will. There's nothing worse than changing your computing environment. And like you, when you go to somebody else's PC, you could right away feel lost. You're like a PC person, you go on a Mac. Or, you know, you're generally a PC person, but now you got to, you're traveling, so you're going to use your Surface Pro. And things, you know, aren't where they should be. And, you know, you can quickly upset an organization by by implementing that sort of thing. So you, you sort of um, have to educate, uh, you know, uh, stakeholders as to why it's important and, you know, why, why it could be, you know, it could be useful. Now, as far as, you know, a specific recommendation. I mean, I haven't done the research. I mean, John has, you know, has been sort of he's adopted it. You know, but I haven't. I haven't taken the next step and saying, yeah, that's something I want to do. Just because, you know, I, 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 sometimes I think, you know, yeah, that's all I need in the world is one more learning curve. I'm, you know what I mean? I'm out of, I'm out of learning curves today, right? I, the 500 I had are gone, and now I just <laughs> need one more. Well, uh, yeah, it does. I mean, like any tool uh, or any any solution that you adopt for anything, uh, it's gonna it's gonna take some time for the organization to get used to it, familiar with it. Everyone is in, and to get everyone on the same page. That's that's a necessary evil. But uh, with in my experience with these tools, that ramp up time doesn't take that long. Obviously, it would vary depending on. Um, you know the size of your organization, how sophisticated everyone uh, is starting uh, is starting from, and and things like that. But um, well, and you, you have know, the sexual problem. You have the sexual problem, John. That in in a in a clinical environment, you know, it, it's really you know there's this, this well-established pecking order. I mean, 
look how long it took you know, doctors to get on electronic health records. It took till the government incented them in 2009 for the healthcare industry in mass to join the 21st century. Doctors were just happy using paper. And, you know, they were as happy as can be, man. You know, and like Martin was the happiest pigs and shit. They just keep you, you, you know what I mean? Even though it was the most freaking Luddite backwards. And, it, it, you know, so the, the healthcare is a special case of doctors hate and, and it's not without it's not without some justification like hate logging in and logging out every time you know they gotta they gotta do something because I mean how how long does the doctor spend with you when when you go to the, the I, I'm diabetic right so I gotta go every three months I gotta go to check my A1C and you know blah blah, blah. and you know my doctor's actually pretty good I mean maybe I get ten minutes you know and and they just hate this logging in logging out and. They don't do it, really. They leave that screen open. I mean, I, you know, if I wanted to, I could jump on and try to do something, but I'm not interested, and, you know. But, yes, it, it is this, it, healthcare is this thing onto itself. And this pecking order, the docs are God. And, you know, so you have this, you got to deal with that somehow organizationally, which adds just to the general organizational problem. Martin, anything else? Not, not at this point. Okay, so we're going to do our run through our shameless plug really quick. Uh, probably most of you know that we've uh, released Espresso um, about four months ago. When, how long? When was this? I can't even. I forget. You know, August. 20th? August sixteenth. So we have hundreds of users now using Espresso in, in our marketing pitches. And with Espresso, you can do a risk assessment in three hours or less. Now, how is that possible? Well. Uh, it's because we spent thousands of hours abstracting the problem and matching threats and vulnerabilities and creating, pre-populating Espresso with 150 risks, and those risks all implicate the 29 security rule controls that you have to implement. So, you know, it's not, but for the fact that we extracted the problem, it would be impossible to do uh, a risk assessment in three hours or less. And remember, risk assessment is just an analysis step. We have the risks there because some risks are universal like social engineering and intrusion. What do you care about the 400,000 ways that somebody can get in? It's like once you get in, what are you going to do, right? And so some things are uniform, universal across practices. So that's how we were able to do that. We, we've sort of abstracted these threats, vulnerabilities. And if anybody's tried to attack this problem, uh, just like on paper or think about it, it's enormously complex, enormously complex. So we, we've had now, we have hundreds of users Using Espresso 1.0, we're about ready to come out with Espresso uh, 1.1 for doing risk assessments, which is the foundation of your compliance with the security rule. If you're not doing a risk assessment, then you're out of the game right there. You're probably in willful neglect, right? Espresso deals with security objects. It's kind of like inventory, but much broader, you know, devices. And we already present you with a tree, devices, places, persons. You know, it comes pre-populated. You can change the tree, and you can uh, apply... Uh, controls at any level of the tree, but we don't give you a blank sheet of paper. We, we pre-populate that uh, for you, but we also say, you know what, you don't have to spend six months gathering all your inventory. You can do a, a risk assessment in three hours or less without security objects. There's no mandate from HHS and the security rule that you got to have all your inventory in place before you do an analysis, right? It's like the analysis is, is, is everything is, has relative importance to it. So we deal with security objects, threats, vulnerabilities, impacts, blah, blah, blah. But the magic sauce is that most of that is pre-populated. This is the home screen. You see 150 risks identified. You see these vulnerabilities, these 29. These 29 map to the actual security rule, secure, security rule implementation specifications. And the implementation specifications is really an old word for controls. Those things that are called implementation specifications, security rule, are really security controls, okay? We identify all of, all of them. They're implicated in these 150 risks that we've pre-populated for you. So if, you, if you've already identified them, your job is to go through this risk assessment, calculate probability levels, which we don't do for you because that's the hard thinking, and then go about the business of actually implementing, mitigating, you implementing those controls. So for example, a security rule uh, implementation specification says you have to have a disaster recovery plan. Well, if you don't have one, that's a vulnerability. Well, how do you mitigate that? Well, you go create one, right? Well, you don't do this.
just in the risk assessment step. That's just the analysis step. You know, so we quickly get you up to the literacy curve so you can get busy mitigating. That's that's the whole thing behind Express. So when we're about to release uh, in January 2017, release 1.1, which is going to add some uh, some features that have been uh, that our users have been uh, calling for. Uh, and I've just gone quickly through these screens because you guys can go through them uh, yourselves. Eventually, you get this master risk assessment report that you can present to your covered entity if you're a BA. And we're working with a lot of BAs that say, because covered entities are now becoming really sophisticated and saying, hey, show me some proof. I need to get these satisfactory assurances that you, Mr. BA, like that one example that our patient system is, is on the cloud, well, you know, if you're the covered entity, if you're the compliance officer working with that cloud vendor, you want to say, well, show me, give me some proof. Give me some visible demonstrable evidence that you're complying with the law because now you're on the hook to comply with the law. Well, if you were using Espresso, you could put print out this, you know, this uh, risk assessment report and show how you're attacking it, which risks have been identified as high, medium, and low. Maybe you already have a disaster recovery plan. So you, the risk the impact to your organization of a fire or something like that, uh, a hurricane may be high, but because you have this disaster recovery plan, you know the 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 impact would be the impact would be high, but because you have the the uh, disaster recovery plan, the probability that 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 threat would exploit the vulnerability is low. Therefore, the risk is low, right? So that's the hard part of doing a risk analysis is doing the hard thinking about how these risks impact your organization. Nobody can do that magic for you. The magic that Expresso has done is rationalize the problem by identifying risk and threats and vulnerabilities that apply, that universally apply. So with that, uh, you know, now our subscription plan with Expresso is $24.95 the first year, okay, and then it's an optional $12.95. And so not only you get Espresso, but you get our 30 products that help you mitigate the um, the controls that you've identified that are lacking in with Espresso. So we like to think that we provide the recipe, not just the ingredients, but we provide educational products. Like we have over 16 training products, and and are and are about to add a, a a a training product on phishing. We also have a certification now uh, that you can that you can get from the HIPAA Survival Guide. It's a I think um, Debbie was telling me, John, I don't remember, I think it's 260 questions, you know, mm -hmm. true, false questions that you get to take, that you take after you, um, you know, go through our training programs, which are 15, at least one hour, sometimes one hour and a half videos, uh, presentations on various topics covering the rules, covering audits, and um, you can either have us grade it for a nominal fee or you can grade it yourself if you're the compliance officer and you want to certify other people in your organization. Uh, so we keep coming out with different products that help mitigate. For example, we're, we're gonna, about to come out with a product uh, called the Contingency Framework that deals specifically with one of the most hardest things to do in the street rule is, is to develop that disaster recovery plan because there's this contingency standard and then you have underneath that you have a disaster recovery plan, you have an emergency mode operations plan, and you have this um, criticality assignment of uh, information systems based on the order that they would have to be restored if there was an emergency or if there was a disaster. Anybody that's ever tried to create a disaster recovery plan knows just how complex that is. That's worth the price of admission by itself, we think. So that's the kind of value that, that, that we're providing in our subscription. It doesn't matter if you're a business associate or a covered entity, we're agnostic. It's really educational wear, wet wear, right? This is what we're trying to improve your literacy. That's what we do. Uh, and we think we do that better than anybody else in uh, the industry. So with that, I'm going to say if there's any other questions, uh, we will be happy to take them. Otherwise, thank you for listening. It's been our pleasure. Happy holidays. There are no more questions. Happy holidays. Okay, great. And Martin, um, you record these, right? And periodically we make the recordings available to uh, the public. And if anybody uh, hasn't gotten the handouts, then get the handouts or send us an email. We'll send you the handouts. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Thank you, everybody.